Welcome to Truth for Transformation. I am Timothy Brown, and I am delighted that you decided to study God's Word with us today. I want to encourage you to go and take your Bibles out. We are going to go through God's Word verse by verse today. And I also want to invite you to share this with your friends and family and like this page. We want to get God's Word out around the world, changing lives one life at a time. Let's prepare our hearts for God's Word. Father, we thank you that your Word is truth and that your Word has the power to change our lives. So Father, as we look into your Word, speak to our hearts and help this be a day where the truth changes our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So go ahead and take out your cell phones. We're getting in the habit of this. You're like, we can use our cell phones in church for one purpose, either the Bible version app, or go ahead and open Facebook and share the live stream. Look under Radiant Church. You guys have been sharing every week and getting the message out. So go ahead and open Facebook, type in Radiant Church and share it on your wall. This will help get the message out to everyone. And speaking of those online, we wanna welcome you. Thanks for joining us. Let's prepare our hearts for the word. Father, as we look into your word, speak to our hearts. We ask and pray that we would be forever changed, Lord. We ask and pray that you would bless your word, that your Holy Spirit would work today. So, Father, we give this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many of you remember the story of the coal miners in Chile that got trapped 200 feet underground? Anybody remember that? So they, they, we got a few pictures here. Here's all the coal miners, and they were trapped for 69 days underground. And basically, they realized that they may never live to see the light of day. So all of these men began to rally around one guy named Jose, who was a Christian, and they said, can you pray for us? So Jose started a, a daily prayer gathering, and he would give, they would give a little message, a little sermonette. They would pray together and share a meal. And God began to work in all of these men's lives. Because when they were at their lowest, they recognized their need for God. So one of the untold stories is that one of the prayer gatherings, the, the guy that was leading, Jose, began to call out some of the sins. This gentleman over here doesn't treat his wife very nicely. He raises his voice, and the guy didn't argue. This guy over here is a deadbeat dad. And they were just, you know, and no one argued because they were 200 feet underground, and they began to pray and repent. But all of a sudden, as you guys saw the national news, that there was a rescue effort, that they were trying to rescue these guys before it was too late. So they were able to drill a small sliver down into the rock, and light came down, and they brought down extra food and water supplies, and also, of course, you've got to have iPads. So iPads were delivered. And as these men recognized that they were soon going to be delivered, all of a sudden, they, many of them stopped praying. Many of them stopped having the daily devotional, and many of them went back to the way they were before. And then isn't it true that in our lowest point, we often reach out for God, but sometimes the tendency is that when we're rescued or delivered, we go back, life is normal. And this is the untold story of these Chilean miners, but it's also the story of many of us that when life is good, you know, like we sometimes forget God, but when we hit rock bottom, then we're calling out for God. So what we're going to do is continue in our series through the book of Revelation. For those of you joining us, I want to give you a basic intro that we've been studying biblical prophecy. About one in every four verses in the Bible, the New Testament at least, is prophetic. So for people that skip prophecy, you kind of skip one-fourth of your New Testament. So we believe that prophecy is given not only to understand the future, but it has present tense applications. So in the church timeline, what, what's happening is we're in the last days. We all know that. We all believe that. Even among Americans, we believe that, you know, something's about to happen. 
And according to biblical prophecy, there's different views, but the view we take here is that one day there's going to be the rapture of the church. Paul tells us that the trumpet of God will sound, the dead in Christ, those who have died that are believers will be resurrected, their bodies, and we who are alive and remain will be called up together. That's the rapture. After that point, there's going to be a seven-year tribulation, which we're reading about in the book of Revelation. This is the time of unparalleled grief, unparalleled death. And when, when a lot of Christians read it, we like skip over it because those are the hard passages. But every passage in the Bible is relevant, all 66 books. Even Leviticus is relevant. Those names that you read, so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so, many of those people you'll meet in heaven one day. Then it will have relevance. Every verse of all 66 books of the Bible is inspired and relevant. So what we're doing is taking this scripture and talking about what's going to happen during the tribulation. And for people ask, well, how do you know the church will not be in the tribulation? Well, Revelation 2 and 3 talks about the church. Revelation 4, John hears a voice saying, come up here. And then John finds himself in the spirit in heaven in Revelation 4 and 5. And guess what? The church is not mentioned again until Revelation 19, where we're coming back with Jesus on the white, he's riding the white horse, we're following him. So the church is not mentioned in the tribulation. So as we read the horrific events, sometimes we read it and we're like horrified, but keep in mind, if you are truly born again, you will not go through the great tribulation. And all God's children said, amen. Because the scripture says God has not appointed us to wrath. And this will be the time of God's great wrath. So let's read... Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 through 17. Again, welcome those listening online. It says in verse 7, When he, talking about Jesus, opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. This is the fourth horse we're talking about today. And the name of him who sat on it was Death. And Hades followed him. And power was given to him over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. And he opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they crowded with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge your blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and the brethren who would be killed as they are was completed. And I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, behold, a great earthquake, and the sun became as black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, And the stars of the heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it was rolled up. And every mountain and every island moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains And to the mountains and rocks they said, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? May God bless his word. So a little review of last week, if you'll take out your listening guides. Last week we talked about the first three horsemen of the apocalypse. There's four horsemen that we see. The first seal represented false seal from the white horse rider. You guys remember the white horse rider? Some people say, is that Christ? It wasn't Christ. He doesn't come to Revelation 1911, but this is none other than the Antichrist, offering peace, but there's no peace, false peace. In the second seal, we see unleashing war through the red horse rider. This red horse represents the bloodshed of war, and there's so much bloodshed we see in this chapter. In the third seal, we see widespread scarcity by the unleashing of the black horse rider. After war, there's usually scarcity. And we talked about, you think inflation's bad now. How many of you think inflation's bad? You go to the grocery store. During the tribulation, one loaf of bread can cost as much as $200. Talk about inflation. That that is insane. 
So here we pick up in part two. So the first point is the, fir- the fourth horseman. He's riding on this pale green horse and he unleashes widespread death. Now, before we go into the details, a lot of people will throw up a flag and say, how could God allow this to happen on the earth? You know, why so much bloodshed? Why so much devastation? How could a loving God do this? And I want to remind you that when God comes, he brings life. But when Satan comes, he brings death and destruction. So a lot of people ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? How many of you have heard that question asked? The reality is we live in a fallen world and Satan is temporary, the God of this age, the small G of this age. He's a small God. And God is holding Satan back. So I want you guys to get this picture. When the church is raptured up, the church is holding back a lot of the evil. But when we are taken out of the way during the tribulation, Satan's leash will be extended. And he's going to begin to unleash havoc like we have never seen. So we see what Satan is going to do during the tribulation. We see the Antichrist. We see these demonic people on horses unleashing wrath. And you're like, well, why would God still allow it? I don't get it. The reality is revelation is a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call for the lost nations. It's the final chance to be saved. God is calling on them to be saved It's like a house is on fire, the people are asleep, and you are banging on the door saying, wake up. So revelation, the tribulation, is a wake-up call to the lost nations, a final chance for salvation. It is a wake-up call for the nation of Israel. We're going to see in chapter 7, 144,000 Israelites get saved. And these are not a particular denomination. So many people have claimed to be the 144,000. Listen, that doesn't happen until the tribulation. So you can't claim to be the 144,000, and it's the Israelites. It mentions 12,000 from each tribe. So this is the final wake-up call, because here's the reality. Eternity without God is the worst thing you can imagine. Hell is the worst thing. to let. So seven years of wrath as a wake-up call, it's, it's almost like God saying, listen, I, I, this is what it's going to be like forever. Repent now before it's eternally too late. And we do see in chapter 7 a great revival break up break out. A great revival hits the the land. People get saved. And John looks out and sees the 144,000. And then the end of chapter 7, he sees people in white robes, so many that he can't even count it. So with that being said, let's look into this fourth horseman of the apocalypse. The pale horse represents death. The the word chloros, it's the Greek word. It comes from a Greek uh, word. It's where we get our English word chlorophyll. And basically, this word represents a yellowish green. Think about something that's pale. John MacArthur rightly pointed out that when you think of something that's pale, you think of a a corpse. Some of you have had the the experience when you've seen a dead body, it's not always pleasant because the blood leaves the body and the body turns pale. Many of you have seen that. So it's the idea of this horse comes out and it represents the upcoming death and destruction. Notice the writer's name. His name is Death. And Hades is closely following death. Now what is scary, you know, keep in mind as Christians, if you're a Christian, you're not part of this tribulation. It says that this writer, through all this death and destruction and what's to come, one-fourth of the world's population will be destroyed. I just want you to take that in. One-fourth. Right now, there's about over 8 billion people on planet Earth. One-fourth would be at least 2 billion people destroyed. And you're like, I can't fathom that. I can't fathom it either. If COVID wasn't bad enough, we, we saw a lot of death and destruction. We don't minimize that. But think about 2 billion people. And that's why as Christians, this is a wake-up call that we got to get the good news out. We've got to get the good news out because none of us want our loved ones, our family and our friends to miss out on the rapture miss out on meeting Jesus face to face and have to go through the tribulation. That This is the time that the world has never seen anything like it. So you see this mysterious killer galloping on this pale horse. It represents death and destruction. This sinister servant of Satan is galloping across the earth, killing one-fourth of the population. And in this grim reaper's footprints, you see the mouth of Hades open wide to swallow up all the lost souls who will die physically and eternally. 
Satan's ultimate goal is death and destruction. Only those who have found in Christ are eternally safe. So seek refuge in Jesus today. Don't allow yourself to be swept away by the currents of this world because the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Is death, and we see that right here. So for the Christian, as I mentioned, it's a wake-up call. And I want to give just a basic illustration for us to understand it. How many of you celebrate and recognize our firefighters? All right, paramedics. We got one on the front row here, John. Let's give John a hand. He's part of our first responders. So I got a little brief video to show you what kind of danger firefighters put themselves in. Let's watch this video. Burn me to the ground. I did my part. I tried my best. The things I'm fighting to protect always shatter into pieces in the end. Oh. All right, so the world is on fire, and you and I are called as messengers of good news that, listen, Jesus didn't come to bring death and destruction. He came to bring life and it more abundantly, and you and I are called with a life-giving message to say that Jesus loves you so much, he doesn't want you to experience this eternal death. He doesn't want you to experience this trouble that we see in the tribulation. He came to rescue you from death. He came to set you free. The good news is that Jesus has come to bring us from death into life. Because Jesus came back to life the third day, you can come back to life again. Amen. That's the message we have of the gospel. Let's give God a shout of praise. Amen. So the second point is we see the fifth seal. And keep in mind, Jesus is unrolling this scroll. So for those of you who are listening online and via radio, this is a scroll he's unloosening. And every time he unloosens a seal, the scroll more is read. So here's the fifth seal. We see the slain martyrs. Look at verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. So these are the Christian martyrs. These are the people who will accept Christ during the tribulation. And because of their faith, guess what? The Antichrist, you think he's going to like people getting saved? You think the devil's going to like people getting saved? No, and he will kill many of them. Many of them will kill. And what we'll find later in Revelation is this mark of the beast where you can't buy or sell unless you have this mark. And if you don't take it, it's starvation and sometimes it's execution. So that's why we call this the Great Tribulation, especially the last three and a half years is so horrific that so many people will die. So where is the church? As I mentioned, the church is in heaven and the church is in our glorified body. So whenever the rapture takes place, the Bible says those who have been buried their physical remains, the ashes. So whether you're cremated, buried, sprinkled out the sea, God will resurrect the ashes. And you're like, well, what does it look like when you die now? I thought you go straight to heaven, right? And the answer is you do go straight to heaven. Well, what form will you be in? If you get a resurrected body after the rapture, right before the tribulation, what form are you in heaven right now? The Bible is not clear on that. So what we can do is just give some sanctified speculation this is my opinion i believe that you'll have a temporary body until you get your eternal body so to make it very simple how many of you have ever had your car in the shop and they gave you a loaner car right all of us have experienced the loaner and it's cool i mean it's like new and it's like wow it's better than the old one i wish i could keep it and then you get your car back so here's the reality when you get to heaven we recognize on the mount of transfiguration moses and elijah you remember Peter, James, and John, like, there's Moses. There's, they could recognize their physical forms. So I believe there's enough in Scripture that would imply that you do have a physical form because I don't believe God wants us to be a disembodied spirit. 
I think you'll have a temporary. And what happens, you're like, why would God even raise the ashes? That makes no sense. Why raise the ashes? What's the point? Here's the point. Jesus is Lord over all. And everything that sin did to you, God's going to undo to the very ashes. He's concerned about the very atomic principles and particles of the world. So he will glorify and resurrect you all the way down to the ashes of your body. Amen. That's how it's like sin, you did that. Satan, you did that. Bam. Resurrected, glorified body. Everything that sin did, God will undo. And that, that is good news. That's how powerful God is. That makes that makes even a Baptist want to shout, a Presbyterian want to run the aisles. <laughs> so notice that these people will get saved, but there are widespread persecution. And Jesus in Matthew 24, and for those of you who have not read Matthew 24, Revelation could be considered almost a commentary. This is like explains what, what Jesus meant in Matthew 24. Jesus says, for there will be great tribulation. Where do we get great tribulation? It's right here by Jesus. Such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. So you notice those under the altar, these are people who have been slain. And some scholars believe this could represent the altar of incense. And notice their plea, like, God, when are you going to give us justice? When are you going to vindicate our bloodshed? And this is the reality we live in the world today. How many of you have ever been treated wrongly? How many of you have ever been done unjustly? Like everybody, right? And what what Jesus presents to us through his word, through John, is that God is a God of justice. And we're gonna gonna get very practical in just a moment. But notice that he says there's gonna be a few more believers who will give their lives until the number is fulfilled or completed. And you're like, that's kind of gruesome. More people are gonna die. But here's another way to look at it. God puts a limit on evil. He says, this is far as I'm gonna allow the devil to go. I'm gonna put a limit on evil. I'm gonna put a limit on the number. And aren't you glad the great tribulation, we're not gonna be apart as believers, but imagine if it lasted 700 years instead of seven, right? Seven years seems like a long time, but it could have been 700 years. It could have been 70 years. So he puts a limit on evil. And notice they were given these white robes. This represents purity. This represents the status in the kingdom. So here's the application for today. As I mentioned, prophecy is practical. So how do you respond when people treat you unjustly? How do you respond when people do you wrongly? How do you respond when someone that you're close to, a family or friend, has been unjustly killed or done wrong? How do you respond? Well, the Bible says in Romans 12, let's go and throw this on the screen. Romans 12, it says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. But I want payback, all right? We all want payback. But he says, don't give place to wrath, for it's written, vengeance is whose? It's God's. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy's hungry, slap him in the face. Does it say that? No. If your enemy's hungry, what? Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will reap coals of fire on his head. And I love verse 21. This summarizes it all, Romans 12, 21. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by doing good. So here's the scenario. You have been done wrong. How many of you have ever had a conflict with a neighbor before? I raise my hand. A lot of hands in here. So you can overcome evil by doing good to that person. You're like, what if they don't respond? Your job is not the response. Your job is the action of goodness. Because what happens if someone does you wrong and you stay in that offense, they're in the driver's seat. But whenever you do good and commit it to God, God's grace is in the driver's seat. They don't have the last word. God has the last word. They don't have the authority. God has the authority. So do good. Bless those who persecute you, the Bible says. So stop thinking about how you're going to take vengeance. Stop taking matters into your own hands. Instead, do good. You are children of the light, so shine that light to others. Amen? And number three is the sixth seal. We see destruction and dismay. So in verse 12, it says, And I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. So what we're going to see in the sixth seal is when you often think of end-time prophecies, all these images come to mind. Notice there was a great earthquake. Whenever you have great earthquakes, 
often what follows is volcanic eruptions. And John MacArthur, a great scholar, said that when you think about a volcanic eruption, you think of ash being thrown into the sky. You think of the atmosphere changing. So here's what changes. The sun becomes dark. When you've got volcanic ash and the particles flown out into the space, it's like, man, this is, I can't even see. The sun is darkened. Can you imagine the moon being like blood? I mean, that's like creepy. Like you look out and it's like blood red. That's just like, wow. The stars of heaven will fall. What are the stars? We're not told, but this could be like a massive asteroid or it could be a meteor shower. Now, the most bizarre thing in this passage is the sky. Notice it says the sky will recede like a scroll. Can you imagine looking out and there being no sky? I mean, I can't even picture that in my mind. I look and there's no blue sky. There's no sky at all. Like, where's the lid? It's like, <laughs> I mean, when I, when I picture this, I just can't fathom it. And in Isaiah 34, verse 4, it predicts this. It says, all the host of heaven will be dissolved. And the heaven shall be rolled up like a scroll, and their host shall fall down as the leaf falls from the vine, and as the fruit falls from a fig tree. Notice that every mountain and island will be removed out of its place. So Thomas Nelson, another great, it's a wonderful Bible commentary. Nelson says that what God did in Genesis 1 by creating everything, it's we see during the tribulation things are being undone. Things are being shaken up. And the reason for that is Revelation 21's coming. What happens in Revelation 21? There's a new heaven and a new earth. So what God did in Genesis 1 He's preparing for Revelation 21 when there's a new heaven and a new earth coming. So be encouraged, my friends. God is doing a brand new work. So what's what's fascinating for me, perhaps the most fascinating part of this, is notice it's towards the last verse, verse, skip down to verse 16. It says that these people, these rich as well as the poor, kings as well as slaves, they will say to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So I want you to picture this. The people in the great tribulation, they know who God is and they know who Jesus is. And they're still alive, so they can repent, they can ask forgiveness, they can get saved just like all these others are going to be getting saved. We see in Revelation 7. So why would lost people choose to stay lost? Why would people that are going through all this, they've seen two billion people die, and their friends and family, think, think about it, these are people and their, their family, these are friends, these are coworkers, these are boyfriend, girlfriends, husbands, spouses, two billion people have died, and they're like, hey, instead of getting right with God, I would rather just be a suicidal, I'd rather just the rocks fall on me. How stupid is that? Did you know that sin makes you stupid? Sin makes you stupid. It's like all you have to do is accept Jesus. He, he's offered it. And we're going to see in Revelation, he even sends an angel to preach the gospel to the whole world. Just in case we don't get to share to everybody, at the very end, there's going to be an angel that flies around giving the everlasting gospel to everyone. So what about the person in Africa that's never heard? An angel is going to come during the tribulation. Everyone's going to hear. So here's the reality. It's the question of why do lost people choose to stay lost? And there's different answers. I think one thing is, is they like the darkness. They want to stay in the darkness because if I follow Jesus, it means I'm going to have to change my life. Who wants to change their life? Who wants to repent? Only those who turn to Christ. Lost people choose to stay lost. It's not that they can't be saved. They make a choice. So this is what Jesus said in John 3, verses 19 and following. He says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world. And it says that, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. So have you ever had anyone hate you because you're a Christian? You didn't know why? Here's why. Everyone who hates evil, excuse me, everyone who hates the light, in verse number 20, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come to the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light their, that their deeds may be plainly seen that what they have done in the sight of God. So here's the reality. There's good news. Even in the midst of this bad news, here's the reality. Jesus came for the lost, and that includes you and I before we were saved. 
Jesus was known as the friend of sinners. And here's the thing, Jesus gave his life so that sinners like you and I could be saved. Because Jesus was a friend of sinners and gave his life for them, we should give our life for the lost. How do we do that? We pray for the lost. We love on the lost. We share Jesus with the lost. We give the message that because Jesus changed my life, he can change your life. Because Jesus died and came back to life, he can bring your dead life back to life. Amen? So that's why we encourage you to have these gospel conversations. In your bulletin, there's a slip to record how many gospel conversations. We have a goal of 1,000 this year. Like, why would you set a goal so high? Because we believe the gospel changes life. And we believe as we present the gospel, he changes life. Well, some people say, well, I just, I'll just live the life. And, and, and if they, they, they want to ask questions, they will. Listen, your, your testimony is great, but it's not perfect. Only Jesus' life was perfect. It's been said that you, you share the gospel wherever using words only when necessary. Let me tell you, words are necessary, okay? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How can they hear unless you tell them, Right? So words are necessary. Don't think that your witness alone, your witness opens up doors, but you are not the Savior. Your witness alone cannot save anyone. It takes the message of Jesus Christ. Amen. But there is good news. Matthew 4, 16. It says, The people living in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of the shadows of death, a light has dawned. So it brings up a very practical question that we must ask in church. So many people in America claim to be Christian, and their percentages are really high. And there's a haunting scripture in the New Testament where Jesus says in the last day when he separates those who are saved from those who are not, many people will say, protest that get separated and say, Lord, I preach, I prophesied, I cast out demons, I did miracles, I did many things in your name. And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. So that, that kind of haunts us as Christians. So here's a self-reflecting question. How do I know I'm really saved? How do I know I'm really a believer? In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul tells us this. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you unless, of course, you failed the test? So here's the reality. The goal is not for anyone to doubt their salvation. The goal is for you to test yourself, to prove to yourself that, you know, I have accepted Christ. We are saved by faith alone, not by works. But true faith is never alone. So here's eight reflection questions, eight self-reflecting questions I want you to ask. The first one is, have you placed your faith in Christ alone for salvation? If you're trying to add works, you've got to go back to the cross. It's nothing you bring but a willing heart, a repentant heart. Question two, do you sense the presence of the Holy Spirit living inside of you? If you say no, the Bible says that if you are saved, if you are born again, the Holy Spirit lives in you, so you should be able to sense the Holy Spirit's presence. Question three, has your life truly changed after you prayed for forgiveness? If you are the same old person you were before you prayed the prayer, did you really get saved or did you just get religious? The Bible says even the devil believes in shudders. Head knowledge alone is not going to save you. It's true faith in the true Jesus. It's saying, Jesus, I, I believe and I receive. And when someone as big as God moves in your life, your life will change, guaranteed. And it's a process. It may not happen overnight, but God will change you and he will grow you. Number four, do you desire God in your daily life? Do you desire him? Do you want more of your life to be surrendered to him? Number five, does your soul crave God's word? It's ironic for someone to say, I love Jesus, but I don't love his word. And it's like, well, how do you know about Jesus apart from his word? The word of God tells you who Jesus is. We get to know him by his word. It's like saying that you love chocolate cake, but I never see you eat chocolate cake. I never see chocolate on your face, but I love chocolate cake. Is there any evidence that you're a chocolate lover? I don't smell it on your breath, I don't see it on your face, and I never see you consume chocolate. How many of you want chocolate right now? But so many people are like, I'm a Christian. Do you love God? Well, yeah. Do you keep his commandments? No. I love God, but I don't like his church. Oh, really? Okay, let's talk about that. Number six, are you growing in the fruit of the Spirit? Are you becoming more loving, more joyful, more patient? 
If the answer is no, it may not be that you're not saved. It may be that you've got to surrender more. You may need to walk more in the Spirit. You're not only saved by faith, but you're, you grow by faith. It's not by works. It's by following Jesus in faith and obedience. This is a convicting question. Number seven, when you commit a sin, do you feel conviction and a desire to change? It's a red flag for a believer that lives in sin and says, I'm okay with it. This is between me and God. Oh, really? The book of Hebrews says that Jesus, he died on the cross, and when you live in sin, it's like spitting on the cross. Read the book of Hebrews. It's like you, you can't persist in sin and claim that you're okay. God's not okay with that. He's, he saved you to set you free from sin, not so that you could live in sin. It's not a get-out-of-hell-free prep pass. It's like because I'm saved, yes, I will commit sin, but I'm wrestling against it. Yes, I'm going to fall down, but I get back up. God forbid that someone claims to be a believer and they live in sin and there's no conviction. Number eight, do you desire to connect with your spiritual family? How many of you have met people that say, I love Jesus, but I don't like the church, right? Or me and my spouse, we do church at home. Really? Okay, let's, where's that in the Bible? That's called a devotional, okay? <laughs> Going to church is the assembled believers coming together, okay? It's good for you and your spouse to do devotions. Okay? You should do that. But in the New Testament, the, the ecclesiology of the New Testament is this, that God has gifted all of us differently. I don't possess the same gifts that you do and vice versa. So for you and your, your spouse to have church, you would have to possess all the gifts of the Spirit. I've never met anyone that gifted. Most people have one or two gifts of the Spirit, maybe some more. I've never met any believer that has all the gifts of the Spirit. And if you do, you're probably deceived. <laughs> you don't have all the gifts. So here's the reality. It's like someone saying, Timothy, I like you, but I don't like your wife. If you don't like my wife, you don't like me, because me and my wife are a package deal. Please don't say you love Jesus, but hate his bride. They are, we are a package deal. He is perfect, we are imperfect, but forgiven. Jesus died, and he set up the church. He shed his blood, so please don't minimize the work of the church. We are not perfect, we are forgiven. But I do believe, ladies and gentlemen, I do believe that the local church, as we present Jesus to the world, Jesus is the hope of the world. And guess what? We are his body. So as we are Christ-centered, as we are getting the gospel out, the local church presenting Christ is the hope of the world because he has no hands on earth but our hands. He has no feet on earth but your feet. You are the body of Christ. And we are called to be his body in this world. Can I get an amen? So let's summarize all of this into one sentence. How about it? Let's throw the big idea on the screen. How do we make sense of this, Timmy? This is a lot. I know. When the world is falling apart, only those who have placed their faith in Christ will truly be able to stand. Now, in the context, this is talking about the Great Tribulation. Chapter 7 tells you about the 144,000 who get saved. They're able to stand. It tells you about a multitude that cannot be counted. They're able to stand. But in today's world, this application is you can stand if you're in Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he says, Therefore, brothers, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. All right, so let's make it practical. Let's, you know, it's easy when we think of eschatology, future events, and like, I'm not going to be here. This has no application, but it does. Prophecy is practical. Here's three applications. Number one, get serious about sharing your faith. When we read about this, I want all of you to have this wake-up call. I don't want my lost family member. I don't want my lost friend to go through the tribulation. I don't want anyone to go through the tribulation. Worse than the tribulation is someone dying without Christ because that's forever. So get serious about sharing your faith. Get serious. Start with those in your neighborhood. Start with those in your home and let that bleed outward. Number two, respond in justice with goodness. In this world, you will be done wrong. In this world, people will treat you poorly. Life is not fair, right? Life is not fair, but God is. And one day, he will right every wrong. So if you've been treated wrongly, if injustice has been your faithful foe that keeps haunting you, commit yourself to the Lord. And one day, when you stand before the judge of the world, he will right every wrong. He is the perfect judge. And finally, take the faith test. Go home. 
If this is hard for you to do, ask someone that knows you well. They're gonna, they'll take the test for you. And this doesn't mean if you're saved or lost, but this is an examination. I want to make sure that I am in Christ. How do you know you're in Christ? If I really have received Jesus in my life, I'm really saved. And if I'm really saved, it will show. If it doesn't show, you've got to check back up. Did I really accept what Jesus did? Did he really move into my life through the Holy Spirit? Because a saved life is a changed life. A changed life is a life that lives for the glory of God and bears fruit for the kingdom. Amen? So preview for next week. We get a little pause in Revelation. So take a deep breath. I know this is hard. Next week is Father's Day. So bring all the gentlemen to your church, uh, to this church, and invite the men in your life. And if they don't come to church, bribe them. Say, I'll take you out to lunch afterward, okay? I'm going to take you out to the steakhouse. I'm going to come to church, right? Bring the men in your life to church. And then the following week, we pick up in Revelation 7, which is actually a little break. It's about people getting saved. So you're like, thank God, this is really hard. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And that, God, your word is a wake-up call for people living now, that I need to make sure I'm right with God. It's a wake-up call for those who don't know that their family members or friends may not be saved. It's a wake-up call to pray for those who are lost. So, Lord, during this invitation, I, I just want everyone around just to think about, think about that person in your life that doesn't know the Lord. Tell, tell God by name in your spirit. God knows who they are. Just list up their name. I'm, I'm lifting up names in my own mind. And Lord, we pray for these people as we're setting them up that they would be saved. For the Christian that's backslidden, for the Christian that's living in a lifestyle of sin that you've been convicted, go ahead and tell God. Repent of that. This is a wake-up call. God doesn't want any saint to stay stuck in sin. He's came to set you free, not so you can live in it. And as the believers continue to pray, I want to speak to someone here today with no one looking around that you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you know it. Like there's this emptiness in your life, there's this void. When I mention about eternity, you just feel this heaviness. Friend, you can know that you know that you're a Christian. How do you know? The Bible says whoever has the Son has life. So if anyone in here today, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand today, but please see me afterward. If you're here today listening to this message, I want you to say this prayer. Say, God, I do believe the good news. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and he rose that third day. And God, I've never really invited Jesus to save me. I never really repented of my sins. I've never really followed you. So today I invite Jesus to save me. So Jesus, I come to your cross. Tell him now, I come to your cross. I admit that I'm a sinner and I need you to be my savior. So please forgive me. Take me just as I am but change me, Lord, with your grace and your love. And Jesus, I choose to follow you from this day forward. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's children said, amen. As we prepare for this response time, if you prayed a decision, whether to draw closer to God or whether you gave your life to Jesus for the first time, let us know. Write that on the connection card. If you're listening to this message online or via radio, let us know. We want to help you take your next steps. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today for Truth For Transformation. My prayer is that God's Word resonates deep within your soul. My mission here at this ministry is to encourage and equip and empower you to reach your full God-given redemptive potential. If you would like to partner with this ministry, you can do so by going to our church website. That is Radiant828.com. Our mission here is to get the good news of Jesus Christ all around the world in its various formats. We want to do this through preaching. We want to do this through writing books that are going to encourage people. And we want to do this through radio and television. So your partnership helps us to reach more lives. We hope that this was a blessing and we hope to see you next week.